In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Daniel. We are, con we are continuing our look at Daniel and his life. So here's what you really need to know to understand what's going on in this passage. King Belshazzar, who is the succeeder of the throne to Nebuchadnezzar, is having this great feast. And there are different kings and heads of state and important people there. And as we looked at in the previous installment of this series, what has happened is he has demanded that the vessels of God that were stolen by Nebuchadnezzar from the temple, that they all be brought in and they drink out of them. And so they're enjoying the spoils of war that were stolen from God's temple. And when they're engaged in this and they're actually praising their gods and their pagan gods while doing all of this, all of a sudden a hand appears. Not a whole person, just a hand. And that hand is writing something on the wall while this big feast and banquet is going on. And this is something that, as you can imagine, is very startling. They're very confused. They can't figure out what's going on. And they also can't translate the writing. It's written in a language that they do not understand. So they panic because, of course, this is such a strange occurrence. They are very concerned about what this writing actually says because obviously when something is written, it's supposed to convey a message and they can't figure out what that message is because they don't understand it. So what King Belshazzar does is he calls for all the magicians and the wise men in his kingdom that are in his employ to come and translate what the hand was writing. And none of them can. And so again, as we're seeing for, I guess, a third time now in this book, when there is something that cannot be interpreted, they rely on Daniel. And we're going to see sort of the backstory of that here in this next passage in Daniel 5, 11 through 12, where it says, There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because of an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar, let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Now, this is an interesting dynamic that I find here. Because the queen who's speaking and giving advice to King Belshazzar is explaining, there is this guy here that will be able to interpret it. Because he was the chief of magicians under your, your king, and, and we all know the explanation we just read, all the things that are attributed to Daniel. So this queen, she knows that Daniel's the guy, but it's also pretty clear that she doesn't really get it. You'll notice here one of the things that she says is, in this person is the spirit of the holy gods. These people are still thinking from a paganistic standpoint. They're still thinking that Daniel's God is one God out of many, and that he's just one of the other gods, and Daniel has the spirit, the ability to interpret because they are the spirit of many different gods that give him some kind of special ability or authority or whatever else it may be to be able to interpret these things and solve all of these things. They're still not thinking about it through Daniel's perspective. They're still not acknowledging the one true God of heaven. And the reason I find that so fascinating is they still know that Daniel's the guy. They're just not real sure about why that is. They're getting an incorrect understanding of where Daniel's power comes from. And I think what's significant about that is that Daniel 
has become so competent and virtuous that even people that don't really understand why have a pretty solid level of respect for him. I think this is something that we are supposed to emulate, that we as Christians are supposed to be so good at our job and supposed to be somebody that other people can rely on and that we protect other people, that we're respected by others. And this is something that is talked about many times in the New Testament as well, so I'm not just coming up with this idea on my own. But this is an example of an Old Testament story where that was the case, to where even these people that are thinking from a pagan mindset, when they need help, they know Daniel's their guy. They know Daniel's the one that they're supposed to turn to. And as Christians, isn't that something that we should wish for? That people, even that aren't necessarily Christians themselves, when they have a problem or a spiritual question that they don't really know the answer to, that they have enough respect for our knowledge and our wisdom on such matters that they come to us, because even though they're in the pagan mindset now, maybe what could happen here is that Daniel, because of his wisdom, because they know that Daniel's the one they're supposed to come to, and that he'll be the one that will be able to make this interpretation, that he'll get a chance, as he has done every time previously in this book, when he does some kind of miraculous interpretation, to proclaim God's glory and help explain to them that there is only one God, and that's where his power comes from doesn't seem that the message always takes, but it does give him an opportunity to spread the truth to them. And as Christians, that's something that we should imp implement in our lives, that other people should want to come to us, that we should make ourselves a resource to others, make ourselves available to other people, and hopefully that will end in us sharing the truth with them and them finally understanding it. That's really what's going on here, that there is a healthy level of respect for Daniel and his virtue and his abilities so much so that they know he's the person they really need to come to with any matter dealing with something spiritual. And that puts Daniel in a position to tell them about the one true God. This also brings another point to my mind. I hear so many people say that, well, if I just lived in Bible times and I actually saw the miracles that the Bible talks about, I would have believed. Really? Really? Because what I'm seeing here are people that have seen Daniel do amazing, miraculous things before and still don't really understand what he's saying. Because remember, up to this point in the book of Daniel, he's interpreted dreams twice. He has, even though he and his friends were drinking water and vegetables, become better and more physically fit than the people that were eating all the king's choice food. And another thing to consider, too, is the episode with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where it's very clear that God saved them from a burning furnace. Yet having seen all of these things, all of these things, there are still people that were in his presence when he did all these things that saw these miracles that still don't get Daniel's central message. And that was true of Christ, and it was true of every prophet in the Scripture. You see, miracles did help establish faith. It did help some people believe, but it's also important to remember that faith itself and the understanding of the principles in God's Word more than the, the miracles that were done are really what's important to belief. Because many of those people that saw miracles, they faded away pretty quickly. It was the people that listened to Christ's teachings and his doctrine and started living the life that he commanded them that stuck around. Because the miracles are just a way to get somebody in the door. And it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. But we have to remember that the core message of the gospel is living the way that God wants us to and living in his image and conforming to the will of him and the image of his son. That's really the message. It's not about the miracles. It's not about the other stuff, even though those things are interesting to us. Really, at the end of the day, the core concept out of this whole thing is to make ourselves as much like Christ as possible. And that's the lesson that we really need to take away from the gospel. Not the miracles, not the flashy stuff that, that really draws our intrigue, but really this idea of daily living like Christ. Stay the course, friends.
Now, y'all know that I am a big believer in personal liberty, and that means I think that you should be free to decide for yourself whether or not you like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.